Good morning. We're glad you're here this morning. It's good to see you. Good to know that you're online watching with us here at Birmingham First Church. I'm Pastor Huey Davis. We're glad that you're here. We look forward to sensing the Lord's presence, singing to Him, worshiping Him, glorifying His name. But we're also anxious that He would speak to us through His Word today, that we might know Him in an even greater way than we did before we walked in this morning. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You for this day. We long to be with you, to worship you, to hear from you. We give you permission this morning to speak to our lives, to our living. We give you permission to encourage us, call us into account. We ask now, Father, that as we open our hearts to you, your Holy Spirit would fall upon us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship him this morning.
Well, it's good to see you here this morning. Good to know that you're online watching. Uh, we've been working through what the Bible teaches us, and today, what the Bible teaches us about the end. Okay, and so you're saying, is this the end of the series? This is the end of my tenure? What, what's the end? Well, we're talking about the second coming of Christ, what the Bible teaches us about the end. And this might be different than what you think it's going to be about. Because the Bible does teach us about the second coming of Christ. The Bible is, is very clear about the end. It's not what you might expect. And we have no control over the wind. In Acts, the book of Acts, <clears throat> chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, Jesus is meeting with the kids. He's getting ready to ascend into heaven. And he's trying to focus them in on what they need to be doing. What, what are the marching orders, Lord? What, what should we be doing? What should we be hard at? And here's the exchange that goes on between them. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Now, let's understand. We'd like to think if we'd been there, you know, we all, we, you know, if I'd been there, it does what I'd have done. But if we'd have been there, we'd have said the same thing. They, they just wanted to know. You have risen from the grave. You have returned from the dead. You have all power and authority on earth. And are you going to just go in there and knock heads on the people that have given us all this trouble all these years? Are you going after the Romans? Are you going to make sure that they understand that we're now in control? That's what they wanted to know. When are... When are we going to get in and sit on those thrones you talked about? And listen, wouldn't you not have asked the same question? But it's interesting Jesus' response to them. He said, you know what? Don't focus on that. Instead, focus on this. And this is the very first thing the Bible teaches us. Well, not the first thing, but one of the things the Bible teaches us about the end is this. We are to be a witness. That... The Bible teaches us to be a witness. What did Jesus say to them? You will be my witnesses here and there and everywhere. You'll be a witness. And that's the very clear truth that is ex expressed by Jesus. We're to be witnesses. And the second thing is, we will not be forewarned about his return. You know, uh, in these days of... Um, we, I saw some people taking baby pictures. The, the wife had a three-year-old and her son. They were in these flowers. And they had the pictures from the doctor from the sonogram. And they were taking pictures. And now, what they're going to do with these pictures is they're going to say, you know, we're with child. And they're sharing this glorious news with everybody. We, we do that. And if you're going to get married nowadays, you know what the first thing you do? You know, after you get a ring and all that stuff, decide on the flowers and the pattern of China and the crystal. After you do all that stuff, you know what you do? You have a save the date. We're not, we're not inviting you. We're not inviting you. But we want you to be thinking about this date in case we do invite you. I mean, you may not be on the list, but just in case you made the list, here, put this on the refrigerator, which is the important place in your house. Put this on the refrigerator with one of those magnets you bought for 79 cents 100 years ago and save this date. We want you to be praying about it. We want you to be focused on this. Save the day. Jesus is not going to send us a card from heaven that says, I'll be back on the 25th. Wouldn't that be cool? Would you not show up at church the very next time the doors were open to see if everybody else got a card? Did you get a card? Hey, what did you get in the mail? Did you get anything? 
I, mean, I got this thing right here that says, you know, I think uh, my best friend's coming back. We're going to go see him. Wouldn't that be wonderful if Jesus gave the full warning? But you know what he said? I don't know when my father's going to call all the sin to, but when he does, I'm coming back. We'll not know ahead of time. The Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus will return. The dead will be raised, and the final judgment will take place. The Bible teaches us about the resurrection of the dead, that the bodies of both the just and the unjust shall be raised to life and united with their spirits. And then, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of the damnation. That's what the Bible teaches us. The Bible teaches us about the future judgment in which every person shall appear before God to be judged according to his or her deeds in this life. The Bible teaches us about an everlasting life that is assured to all who savingly believe in and obediently follow Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible also teaches us that those who do not believe and follow Jesus shall suffer eternity in hell. We have a responsibility to be a witness, to lead people to, saving, to a saving knowledge of Jesus, that we should spend our time, efforts, and abilities doing this, being a witness. When will we return? When will he return? What difference does it make? Be a witness. That's what the Bible teaches us. Be a witness. But the Bible also teaches us this about the end. The Bible teaches us to be ready. In Luke chapter 21, verses 34 through 36, Jesus says this, Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with dispensation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close on you unexpectedly, like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. The Bible teaches us to be ready for His return. That we need to be constantly aware that he's coming back and we need to be constantly at the task of being ready because the Bible teaches us that those who do not believe in Jesus are hopelessly and eternally lost some would think oh they're going to get a second chance there's no second chance when he comes that's going to be it there's not going to be any of this uh, well I got a coupon you know I got, I got this coupon that says I got this pass I've got this fast pass that says I'm going to the front of the line. There's not going to be any of that. And, and the thing that really stands out in this is this. There will be no arguing with Jesus. There will be no manipulation. There will be no negotiation. That when he stands and everybody sees him, when he appears, nobody's going to be able to say, I've got some really good excuses. Not only that, I've got sound reasoning. Why well, I have lived like a hellion from hell, but I still deserve to go to heaven. The Bible says, be ready. There'll be a standard that will not be debated. That those who have believed and have followed Christ will go with him. That those who have not will go someplace where he is not. And we call that place hell because God is not there. As bad as your life may ever have been, God was there. He was watching over you. He was taking care of you. Even when you didn't think he was, he was. But at that moment, there'll be no rush to buy a ticket to heaven. It'll be over. So we need to be ready. We need to believe in Jesus. We need to trust in Jesus. And we need to follow Jesus. Not only do we need to be a witness but we need to be ready. We need to make God a part, not a part of our life. We need to make God our life. We don't need to add him like we add all the other stuff. He needs to be our life. And everything that we do needs to be... He needs to be sovereign 
and all that other stuff that we add to our life needs to come under his direction. We need Jesus. And we need him every hour of every day. And we need to be ready every hour of every day. He's not an accessory. He is life. He's not just something we add. He is the very core of our life. And so we should not be distracted by stuff. Isn't that what he said? Listen to that again. Don't let your hearts be weighed down with dispensation, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. The anxieties of life. Do you know what that says? You're going to have them. And it's very possible that they could capture your imagination and hold your heart to the place that you forget about everything else except your anxieties, that you worry. Now, I come from, in my genes, is the, uh, the ability to worry. My mother was a worrier. She would wring her hands. You know when it says people wring their hands? My mother would stand there and wring her hands. My mother, what's wrong? It's the children in China. I'm concerned. And I'd be like, oh, well, let's, go to the, let's go to the pantry, get some rice out. Let's, you know, we'll send it over there. I mean, it's you, you, about worrying about things that you have no control over. Football season has started. I don't want anybody to jump out. Okay, but football season has started. And you'll never see anxiety like you will every Saturday for the next several months. They'll be anxious at the start of the game. See, you can't be Auburn fans, because we Auburn fans. We don't get anxious about games. Not like you other people. We consider the, to the coin toss, if we win that, we win the first quarter, we win the second quarter, we're ahead at halftime, we're calling it a good day. We don't have anxieties about the second half. We've already won the toss. Our team got there without, you know, going off somewhere else. We're just, we're excited about that. I have no idea what it would be like to be a part of a team or a, a part of a, a group of people who pull for a team that always wins. It must be the most boringest thing in the entire world. You have no, you're like, oh, who are we playing? Number one? Well, okay. Won't this be sad when they lose? Don't be distracted by the anxieties of life. Be ready. You know, we shouldn't be overly concerned about anything. Our future, our present, our past. Instead, we should understand that we live in a transitional time. This is not our home. We are sojourners. We're, we're looking for the city whose architect is God who has built a place for us and is preparing a place for us. I, just this week, I had, um, we had a little ministerial alliance meeting here in Vestavia. They were trying to get one started and was eating. And we acknowledged that the Baptists created the fellowship dinner. We acknowledged that. But then I said, but it is the Nazarenes who have perfected it. There's going to be that great peace, and all people are going to gather. And, and we're going to, to have this wonderful time we need to understand that, and we need to get, we need to, we were made for heaven, and we need to get ready for heaven. When will we return? What difference does that make? Just be ready. And then, the Bible teaches us about the end. Keep watch. Just about every place the Bible speaks about the return of Jesus, there is the command to keep watch. In Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and he's on them hard because his time is quickly becoming the time of his passion, his death, and his resurrection. And, and they're wanting to know stuff about how's all this going to take place. And this is what he says to them. He says, Therefore keep watch, because you do not know on what day your Lord will return. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And then in Luke chapter 21, verses 5 through 9, some of the disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. 
every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they're about to take place? He replied, watch out that you're not deceived, for many will come in my name claiming I am he and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. You know what the end is going to be like? Pretty much just like today. All I know is this. He didn't come yesterday. Today? Tomorrow? A hundred years from now? You know, I don't know. I, I need to witness. I need to be ready. And I need to keep watch. But there are those distractions that can affect our watchfulness. We can hyper-focus on the insignificant. We're good at doing that. I'm ADD, and I understand that. I took the test. My doctor said, well, you blew the top off of those tests. So I was, like, thinking maybe I had a little bit of it. No, no, no. He says, like, you, no, 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 you've got a caseload of it. You're, like, we like to do a special study just on you, all right? I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So I don't have the time for that. I've got things I need to do. So there is, within ADD, though, the ability to hyper-focus. Now, not everybody afflicted with ADD has this, but you can be a person who hyper-focuses. And what this means is that you fixate on a task or a project just with hyper-intensity. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it can be really, really distracting. So I remember sitting in my office, and um, they'd just come out with this two-CD, not a DVD, but a two-CD book filled with images, clip art. You remember that? You remember that, the clip art and the two CDs? You know, and, and so I was like, you know, oh, this is like heaven. I mean, I got, you know, these two CDs. And so I need a picture for the bulletin of a flag of the United States of America. So I went on the CD, and I start flipping through the pages, going down through the CD. Oh, here's one. I bet there's a better one. Two hours later, two hours later, my secretary disturbed me, and I looked up from my computer. She said, you know, something you got to call, something, something going on. I was like, I have just spent two hours looking for a flag of the United States. I now have 53 of them I've downloaded. I'll just choose this first one. Now, see, that's hyper-focus. You can get so distracted by focusing on this thing that you can't think about anything else. I would still be in that office to this day looking at those discs had she not interrupted me. I'm convinced of this. But hyperfocus can exist in your life as well and not even have ADD. You can be so focused, and this is one of the tools of the enemy, hyperfocus. He'll get you to hyperfocus on some insignificant thing to keep you from focusing on what is good and right. Keep watch. I don't know when it is, but I'm going to keep watch. Our focus should be on Jesus and striving for Christ's likeness. We should be looking for him. When will we return? What difference does that make? Keep watch. The Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus will come again. Praise God. Those who are alive at his coming shall not precede them that are asleep in Jesus Christ. That those who are abiding in him shall be caught up with the risen saints to meet the Lord in the air so that we shall ever be with the Lord. How is he going to appear and everybody going to see him? I don't have any idea. Not my problem. Not a problem for him. East and west and how's he going to, where will he be on the globe? Is he going to appear over Antarctica? So, I don't know. I just know this. He's coming back. We need to be a witness to that. We need to be ready for that, and we need to keep watch until he returns. Jesus said, If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So Paul reflects on this when speaking to a church that was struggling with Jesus' return. He was writing the first letter to the Thessalonians, and it caused such a stir and upset some of them. He had to write a second one. But in the first book of Thessalonians, he says this. 
Now, brothers, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that, that, that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, in the 70s, there was a great evangelistic tool the church used that was a film, a movie. They didn't call it a movie because we didn't go to movies then. It was a film, and it was called A Thief in the Night. And it very carefully crafted the narrative of a thief in the night and how he's just going to show up with no forewarning. You may have seen that film back then. You may have heard about that film. But it gets back to this reflection of Paul. You know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Jesus said, if you'd known he was coming that night, you'd have been prepared. But the problem is, you don't know. But you know what you can do? You can prepare. You can keep watch. You can be ready. And you can tell others about his coming. We don't know when it's going to happen. But we do, just as, just as much as we know that we don't know when it's going to happen, we know that it will happen. It's going to happen. What's the Bible teaches us about the end? It's kind of surprising. We should be witnesses. We should be ready. And we should keep watch. So are you a witness? Well, you are. Whether you like it or not, you are. You're either a good witness, a bad witness, or a really great witness. Everywhere we go and everything that we do, people are watching. The people that know you believe are watching extremely close because they want to know that the God you believe in is actually caring for his people and is worth entrusting their lives in. Are you ready? I don't know. And I know this, you can't scare people into heaven for long. I remember sitting in the Shoney's and, um, on 31, there in Hoover, it's quarter to 12, and a Christian friend of mine said that Jesus is coming back that night at noon. Some famous evangelist said he's coming back, uh, not at noon, at midnight. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. I wasn't a believer. And I watched the clock. It was sitting on a wall right above our booth that we were in. And I watched for 17 minutes in case the clock was off. I didn't think about Eastern Standard Time or Mountain Time. I just assumed it was God's time, which was Central Time. And... You know how long that lasted in my life, though? Not very long. Because you can't scare people into heaven. You have to introduce them to a Savior. You have to introduce them to a man of forgiveness who cares about us to the degree that he died for us. Have you met him? Do you know him? Are you living for him? Well, are you keeping watch? Have you gotten distracted? by legitimate things or illegitimate things. Today's just a, a day to call out and say, hey, yeah, I need to make a correction there. I need to find him. I, I need to make sure that I am, I am striving for Christ-likeness in my life. As we move towards our time of prayer, I trust in the Holy Spirit who is speaking to hearts and speaking to lives and is reminding or imploring or calling to you and if he's doing that, we invite you to a place of prayer or to pray where you're at. But let's not leave this place unless we're watching, we're ready, and we're going to be a witness. And may the Lord care for you.
Father, we praise your holy name this morning. Lord Jesus, we glorify you. We praise you. Jesus, we don't ask you to tarry in your coming, but we ask that we would be witnesses to your coming. That you continue to help us to be ready. That we might grow in grace and be more like you. Powered by your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to keep watch. And to keep that watch primary in our lives. There are people here today that are wondering about forgiveness. and Finding Christ as their Savior. We pray that you'd continue to work in their lives. People watching today that need to be encouraged about your return. We thank you for your presence that we sense here this morning. It gives us a little taste of what heaven will be like. And Father, we're anxious to be in your presence every day. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our midst, how you're working. Help us, Father, to make this a place of forgiveness, a place where people can find freedom, a place where people can find family. We ask, Lord God, that you would take care of our needs, that your protection would be upon these grounds and upon these buildings as we minister, as we care for the people you bring our way. Supply our needs that we might be faithful to your calling. Father, be with our sick and our homebound. Be with those who are awaiting tests and results and procedures. Those that are recovering from sickness, infirmities. Father, we thank you today for family and friends who come to this place to worship with us. May may they know your love, the love of this congregation. Be with those who are watching online, Lord God. May you meet their needs and care for them. And as they pray, that you would answer them and would remind them today that you love and care for them. Father, we celebrate in this day and we, we look forward to that day when we will stand face to face with you. In the meanwhile, care for us. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, let me share some information with you. My, my contact information is there. The offering plate's in the back. I will tell you that uh, this week we contracted with um, our roofer, uh, Rob Wood, who did the um, FLC roof. He's going to be uh, repairing the port out front that has sust- sustained some damage over the years, some wear and some other stuff. And um, we're... You know, if you'd like to write us a check for, I don't know, $13,000, that'd be a great thing. Just make sure you make, put on it, roof. Go ahead and do that. That'd be great. If not, any extra would be good. We'd appreciate that as well. You can reach us financially through those ways. Put a check in the back, or you can mail it to us, or you can take care of your giving with the QR code. I got that right. Wait, let's just hold for a second. I got that right. That's the first time in, what, a month? That's really good. All right. I'll move on. But, you know, it takes you that long. So we appreciate your giving, your faithfulness, and um, we look forward to having that repaired. This Tuesday is gym night with friends, and we'll be playing the pickleball. We'll be having, what are you going to have to eat, Jeff? Do you know yet? Peanut butter and jelly again? What are you having, you know? Ah, breakfast. We're going to have ah, breakfast, so we want you to be here and be part of that. I'm going to want my eggs scrambled. You gonna have sausage or bacon? Oh, French toast. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I get that's my fault. I asked him. Okay. So so we're looking forward to that. That'll start. We eat about five, and uh, then we have a a Bible study at about five thirty, and then we play the pickleball and basketball and some other stuff. So if you'd like to be here and be a part of that, we invite you to be here. And then this Wednesday night, we'll have prayer in the sanctuary at 5.30. It's a drop-in affair, and uh, you come and pray. We pray for the service 
We pray for our prodigals, prodigals of the church, and then as the Lord leads you. And then following that, in the fellowship hall, we'll be studying uh, the life of Jacob. This is part three, and it's another good week. So there'll be a lot of stuff going on and some stuff that has far-reaching implications in the life of the people of God. So we invite you to be there and be part of that. It's a place where you can come and not only study the Word, ask questions, but you can make friends. And we invite you to do that. This morning, together, let's recite the Apostles' Creed. Let's remind ourselves of what we believe and what we should witness to. Ready? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's look around, see who's missing, make sure we make contact with them this week and let them know that we love them and they were missing and uh, that you have a week in which not only is God present in your life, but he directs you to the people who are looking for him, that he directs you to the people who are hurting, that you might minister to them as one of the uh, priesthood of all believers. Now receive this blessing. Heavenly Father, I pray today that you would fall upon these people as we leave this place with your presence, your continual watch care love, and mercy upon their lives. Father, help us to be your witnesses in such a way that we are the light and salt in the lives of the people around us. Go with us, care for us, for we ask this Jesus in your name. Amen. God bless you, and you're dismissed this morning.